Welcome to the Boxing Lockdown, powered by SA Boxing Talk. The two gentlemen are in the Zoom house, Cyril and Hayden. Now, if you think back to atrocious decisions in amateur boxing, cast your mind back to 88, the sole final of Roy Jones Jr. losing in a hotly, hotly disputed decision. Has to be one of the worst decisions in history. Fast forward back to 2016 Rio. Now, I don't remember anything about the Olympics except for one person. Michael McConlin. Why? Because he got robbed badly and he gave everyone in Aiba the finger. So, Michael Conlon, good evening and welcome to the Boxing Lockdown. Uh, pleasure to be here, guys. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, Mike, um, also Mick, you're also an MTK fighter, which obviously I'm very proud to be speaking to you. And I met you and we share several friends, including your trainer, um, Adam Booth. He's a great, great trainer. But I was watching the first fight with uh, Nikita, and I thought you won the first fight. But the yeah. second fight, the second fight, it was just, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And even before you turned professional and before I got involved to becoming part of MTK and obviously heading up MTK Africa, before you turned pro, I, I followed you straight away because there was something about you standing your ground, not apologizing for it, and standing, what you, standing up for what you believed in. What was going through your mind at that moment when you, when you decided to give up the, pull up the finger? What was going through my mind? It was just like, you know, Mitchell Boxing, throughout the years, there's been many bad decisions in my career. Um, I've only lost like 14 or 15 times, but there's so a lot of those I, I can dispute and, I, and have rate at, at disputing, but I never really said anything about it because I was in the system. It was part of what we were going through. You just had to get, get on with it, move on to the next one. It is what it is, and, and you got to keep on keep on going, so to say. Um, and I knew Rio was kind of going to be my last games, and I said, I said, I actually said before the games, if anything bad happens here, which I don't think it will because I was so confident that wouldn't go. I says, if anything bad happens here. I'm just going to say fuck you to everybody uh, and, you know, get out of it. Um, so once it happened, and I couldn't believe it, but I knew it was happening. You know, it was like, this is actually happening. Now is the fucking time. Let, let's, let's show what, we got, what, what, what you're about and, you know, take a stand against injustice. Anywhere in the world where there's injustice, I, I'll always put my, my, my voice to it, my hand to it. And, and, and that's the thing. Even all the stuff going on now, I'm putting my voice to it, my hand to it. There's so much injustice in the world and you know, I think that someone needs to stand up and, and take a stand against it. So that was something that I was really happy to do. And then um, looking forward, now obviously now you've turned pro and you, you're doing quite well in your pro career so far. Yeah. How, how is, how now, boxing is notorious for dodgy decisions. Yeah. Are, are you hoping now that things get called right down the middle in your pro career. Well, listen, I suppose professional boxing also has its corrupt side and there also is corrupt decisions in professional boxing and you see it with the likes of, you know, the 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 card and Canelo Triple G where it was 118, 110 or something, I think it was. I forget the judge, but, you know, there's some crazy scorecards out there and I suppose people can just say it's all down to perception and how they see a fight going, but... Um, I think professional boxing, there's more people, there's more of a, a chance to say who is doing the wrong and what is going on here because there's judges' names, whereas in the amateur boxing, there, there is not. There's, you kind of don't know who's judging your face. It's just like a country or someone. So, um, yeah, I think in professional boxing, I, I, I wanted to be all called in, call fur down the lane. And I think I'm in, kind of in a good position where I'm, you know, backed by a good promoter, I have a good management team behind me where, you know, I'm not on not I'm not on the short end of this stick when it comes to pull and boxing, so to say. So so Michael, I mean, after 2016, you, you I mean you were the biggest news. You would have had a lot of people coming after you in terms of you know trying to get your signature. You ended up signing with top rank, and I wanted to find out how easy firstly was a decision like that for you, and secondly, why did you sign for them? Well, suppose it wasn't it was never gonna be an easy decision no matter who it was, because there was a lot of offers. There was a lot of money put on the table, and uh, and you know when top rank came, can I see that the, the stars and uh, 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 and the lights? Because you look at what they have done with fighters of the past, Oscar Alahoyes, 
Floyd Mayweather's, you know, Manny Pacquiao's, they've turned them into global superstars, not just champions. Like, they become crossover stars. So, you know, th- those are the guys I-, I looked up to growing up, and, and-, and I've seen how top rank kind of managed to move their careers, and I felt I'm, I'm in a very similar position. So, you know, they know how to guide Olympians into world champions into international superstars and you know once that came, that part was there we had to talk a bit of money and once the kind of money part was there i, I was happy to say you no know, there was promoters there offering the same and some or one or the promoter was offering a little bit more but i felt that the best career move for me would be top rank Mick, I want to talk about Nikita and the third time lucky. I'm not going to say third time lucky because I believe you beat him. But I want to talk about that moment when you beat him and you beat him wide. The scores were wide. Yeah. When you had your hand raised, I mean, you knew you won the fight. This time there was no dispute, no bullshit, no, you know, no fucking around. But at that moment, when you got that victory, what did it feel like? What was going through your, your mind and soul at that point? You know, a lot of people have asked me this question. I think people expect a different answer. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I was satisfied a long time ago. I was satisfied when I signed that check to turn professional. Um, when I signed that contract and, and that check went into the bank account, I was satisfied there. And I, because I knew, <laughs> I knew what happened. I knew, I knew who was the real champ and what really went down. So it did not bother me um, at all, so, so to say. So I, 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 was, I was happy right from, from the get-go. So, so it really didn't bother me. And then now, moving forward now, um, you, you're number one by the, in the WBO. Yeah. Um, third, in, I think third in the BA and yeah. sixth by the IBF. Is it safe to assume that um, uh, Shakur Stevenson, Stevenson is the guy you're chasing or are you looking at any other? Every champion, every champion every, every title holder is the guy I'm chasing. I don't care who it is. Um, I've always said from the start, I'm not out here. I don't need to call anybody's name because I know I'll get my shot in due time. I'm not out here for like personal kind of, I want to get this guy, I want to get that guy. I want to get a belt. So it doesn't matter who's holding it. I don't care who. It's just a body in front of me. And I know that once I have my opportunity, once that opportunity arises and I get the fight for the title, I will become champion. Now, Michael, you've had two phenomenal trainers at the professional level uh, between many Robles and, of course, uh, Adam Booth, uh, I think you cited reasons for you leaving Robles was to come back home. So there was nothing wrong with, with your trainer. I believe he's a phenomenal trainer. Um, yeah. What is the biggest difference uh, between the two trainers? Like, have you had to, you know, adapt a little bit? Oh, 100%. There's, there's a huge difference. You know, one's, one's here and one's there. Not in terms of levels. I mean, like, on, on the Richter scale, like, one would be this side, one would be that side. They're complete opposites. Um, you know, Manny is... Uh, Mexican state coach, you know, he likes to get that in, say, work, work the body. Whereas Adam is more a technical coach. Um, yes, they both have their technical abilities, and, and, and Adam has his in, say, work on fighting abilities too, with, in terms of coaching. Um, but, you know, it is two different states of boxing. When I, when I was with Mane, I felt I was a more aggressive kind of Mexican style boxer were and then when I went back when I came back over the autumn I kind of came back to my roots which was technical ability and boxing ability because as an amateur I, I, I felt you know, my best skill was being able to outbox and outfade anybody at the same time um, so I, I was happy to kind of move back the autumn and, and work on that because I've seen guys in, in, in them gyms in LA and, and stuff and you know there's there one guy at the start of the year, and by the end of the year, after all the hard sparring and stuff, and and the blows to the head, they're a different guy, and that's boxing. You know what I mean? It's not nice to see, but that's what boxing is. Mick, I want to talk about Andrew Solby. I mean, you fought him as an amateur. How did you grow, and he stayed so small? <laughs> I don't know. Well, he was always older, you know, so he probably was always he was probably more in his uh, his frame at that time. Um, and, and the size he was going to be, he was he's actually, in fairness, he's tall enough for a flyweight. Um, I had great rivalry, rivalry with Andre, and, and you know what, he's a good guy. I like him. Um, it was just, you know, I was I was always on the on the had the short straw of that kind of rivalry. And he's the only person I ever who I've never beat who's beat me. Everybody who's beat me, I've beat them back. So 
Um, anybody's been beaten back, and the fact that you know he he did what he did, um, beat me three times. You know, he's he's a fantastic fighter. Two of those I thought I won. If I'm honest, the first one I definitely thought I won, um, but the second one was it was close. Or sorry, the second one he won WSB, and then the third one was the European final, which was split decision. So could have went, could have went anyway. And then um, looking at how far away do you think you are from a title shot? Well, so if, I, if I'm honest, I thought I could have been boxing for one in August. Um, if it wasn't for the virus and stuff, I believe after St. Patrick's Day, August would have set me up perfectly and I would have probably had a world title fight in my, in my, in my backyard in the Falls Park. So um, that would have been amazing. But the fact that it's not happening, there's, there's not much I can do about it. So I would say... Um, now, fate possibly August, I think I'm going to box next. Um, possibly December or St. Patrick's Day again. So a two or three now. It would have been, it would have, from St. Patrick's Day, it would have been two. That St. Patrick's Day would have been two. But now, with that gone, I think it's said they're going to be two or three. Now, I watched a, an, an interview with you, and I, I, I'm not sure the reporter's name, but it was a bit of a cringy interview. It was about after your fourth fight, you're still in the United States of America. I suppose a couple of the new interviews. When you get like a interview nowadays, I mean, how do you deal with it? It's, it's weird, man. Sometimes you do get them, and it's hard to kind of move around. And when people ask, like, people love to ask me questions about Conor McGregor because. You know, I know Connor, and he obviously walked it with me in my debut. And they, and they started asking, are you still on talking terms with Conor McGregor? What does that even matter if I'm on talking terms or not? You know what I mean? I don't understand why would someone ask that question. So, um, yeah, you do get them. And I think if someone ever asked me, like, a silly question, which I don't want to answer, I just answer with something completely random um, and kind of <laughs> divert the whole conversation to somewhere else. Mick, and that's my next question, because obviously I saw the whole insert with Connor walking into your dressing room, you know, prepping you and hyping you up as well, and obviously walking you to the ring, uh, very vocal ringside, which was great to see with the Irish flag and everything. But what was that moment like when the two of you, because you asked him to jump into the corner of the post, the ring post with you, and acknowledge the Irish fans? What was that moment like? Was that one of your proudest moments representing Ireland, or, or what was it? No, you know what? It as a professional, it's different. Um, when you represent Ireland, I believe it's more on the amateur background than the amateur scene where the Ireland vest is on your back and you've got to go out there and represent properly. Um, you're not Michael Cullen in the corner. You're Ireland. You know, as Ireland versus England, they're Ireland versus someone else. So the first moment representing Ireland is definitely winning the, the Amateur World Championship and being the only Irish man ever to do so um, in however long the World Amateur Championships has been running. Um, but... As a professional, is it my proudest moment? No, um, my proudest moment is walking in front of my, my fans in Belfast. Um, that was a real special moment for me and uh, something that you know, I'll be forever proud of. But that then, moment, um, that, that, so, sorry, so, um, that, that moment in the corner with McGregor, that was, that was, a, that was a great moment, um, you know, jumping up there. It's be, it, it will be one of those, I've had a lot of highlight moments in my, in my career already. And it will be one of those moments which will stay with me forever. Um, you, you, you mentioned that you, you're very proud of fighting in Belfast. But um, the early part of your career, you spent, spent a lot of time in um, LA. How, how was that? How, how was that, obviously, from going, moving away from your normal surroundings? It was, it was difficult, but it was really, really good. Um, I learned so much, um, I believe, it shaped me into the fighter, which I am today, because you know, I, I learned a different style of boxing, which I, I hadn't been able to see. Um, that Mexican style, in close, getting that work in, um, and, and a lot of the dirty little tricks of the pro game. But at the same time, you know, the surroundings, the lifestyle, it was fantastic. You know, living, living in America, living in LA, living a kind of a dream life, but no, for me, it, it, it wasn't to be. My, my missus ended up falling pregnant again. So I says, it was tough enough already being there with me, her, and just the baby because I was always in training. And when I'm in training, 
I'm, I'm as useless as an ice tray on a motorbike. You know what I mean? There's, there's no one, there's not, there's nothing for me to do. Yeah, I just gotta sit back and, and train and rest and train. I know you like, you know, he's like that joke. That was a good one. <laughs> but um, so I just, I, I, I don't do nothing. So when she fell pregnant, I just said, listen, we need to go home and get that kind of family support system around us again. Um, but if it wasn't for that, I would still be in LA with Manny. How are you in terms of fight preparation? Do you watch your your opponents, or do you you know do you leave that to your coach to sort of do, and then you work on your game plan? Uh, how how actively involved are you in that process? Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm very involved. Um, I I like to watch the guys. I, I don't overly watch them, um, but I do like to watch them. I, I do like to get that read on them and uh, see you know what I'm going to be facing. Um, more so, I, I, I would ask my coach. What he watch? He watches a little, um, but my father as well is, is another person who watches an awful lot of stuff for me, and you know, and a, an opinion which I, I, I hold very highly. Mick, it would be inappropriate of me not to ask you any connection to the South African scene in terms of, even though you're speaking to three South African boxing folk, Luduma Lamati. I know you sparred with him. I know you've had yes. some good spars. Um, yeah. I know you two are friends as well. How was it for you sparring with Luduma because he is a world class fighter? Yeah, yeah. Listen, it was it was it was good work. Um, Luduma was a great guy. I actually didn't know this, but he was he was in my division in 20, um, 20, 2011 World Championships. Uh, he he was actually in the in the World Championships in my division, and I did not know he until he told me in the gym, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> Um, but once he came in, I was like, this guy's a, this guy's a super bond with what, what says is he, how is he a super bond with, how does he make with, it's crazy. But, uh, no, it was, it was great spawn. It was great work. Um, you know, he's a very good fighter. Um, someone who, you know, could do a, a lot in the game and it will really be interesting to see. Um, you fighting in the, in the 126 pound division, which is stacked with a lot of talent. Yeah. Um, likes of uh, Stevenson, Warrington, all these guys. Um, where do you think you you fear? Where, where would you rate yourself amongst everybody in the high division? Um, I think I'm in top ten. I honestly think I'm in the top ten. I still, I, I listen. I still got a bit to go. Um, there's still other fighter, fighters out there who you know, can ask a lot of questions of me and I, I'm, I'm excited to see that. That's something that I, I want to do. I want to test myself. I want to face these guys and, you know, prove myself because I know and I've always kind of known it that, you know, the better fighter I'm in against, the better performance you'll see. And, and that's something that, you know, I look forward to showing um, and believe, you know, once the opportunity comes and you put me in one of these top 10, top 10, top five guys, you'll see the best in go come. And I think it's been like that from the amateurs. When I kind of fought at Ireland in the amateurs at home against lesser guys, I never even performed, but I won. I didn't perform, but I won. And that was the thing. I was just getting wins. It was like no problem. But when I went to the international stage, I was cleaning up and I was winning major medals all over the show. The better the fighter, the better performance. And that's, that's the way I've always been. Let's say the next fight does happen against Shakur Stevenson, which is looking pretty likely for you uh, to go into the WBO world title. Would it be bittersweet fighting? in front of an empty stadium as opposed to having all the Irish fans coming over. And obviously, you know how much of an impact they make. Um, would it be bittersweet fighting in front of, sort of, so to speak, nobody? Yeah, listen, I think for me, that would be very bittersweet. Um, see, if you look at all my fights, every single one of my fights has been, you know, a big fruit. I've never boxed in an empty arena. I've never boxed at you know, four, eight, 4 o'clock in the day or, or 6, 6 p.m. I'm always kind of in the main... The main, the main event kind of times um, and in front of a lot of my fans. So the fact that if I, if I was the box in, a, in an empty arena in front of nobody, yeah, it would be tough. Mick, you know, you're fighting a 126. Is the plan to win a world title of featherweight and move up? Or are you going to be staying as a featherweight for your, the rest of your career? Um, well, at the minute, you know what? I'm actually making featherweight easier than what... I was last year, maybe. Um, it seems to be making a lot, I'm making weight a lot easier. And maybe over the last kind of 12 to 24 months, 
I, I've seemed to take it a bit more serious and take, take everything, my whole career, more serious and push, push myself that extra limit every day. And even on the dad and everything they got, I'm, I'm, I'm always on point. So, you know, I, I think I could, I could hold 126 the rest of my career if I want, but I don't want to. I, I want to. I want to win the title at 126, move up, win one at 130, and possibly win one at 135. It's always been my aim to be a three-week world champion and be Ireland's first ever three-week world champion, unless Carl Frampton can beat me to it, um, which he could if he wins one, one more world title against Jamal Herring. But, um, you know, that was always my aim to be a three-week world champion. Um, you say over the past year you've um, sort of taken your career a bit more seriously. Um, what, what, what was the cause of that? What's the reason behind that? Uh, it was, you know, I, I think, well, when I'm 20, 28 now, and it was kind of when I was 26, I, I asked myself, how much longer do you want to be in this game for? And I says, I don't want to be in it longer than, than 32. Maybe I'm going to have to extend it to 33 with this lockdown. But, um, you know, I, so I, I decided i got to give everything 100% so I don't slip up and make any mistakes. Because sometimes fighters do slip up. And I don't want that to happen to me. So I'm making sure that I, I have full commitment in everything I'm doing. And, and, you know, please God, by the end of next year, you know, I'm work, by, the end of, by the end of this year, start of next year, I'm world champion. Now, what you were answering, one of the previous questions was obviously stepping up in weights, going from feather to super feather, then to lightweight, I suppose. Similar sort of trajectory to Vasil Lomachenko. I mean, is that, a, is that a guy that you're looking at? I'm not, not talking about now, but certainly in the future. Definitely. Listen, in my opinion, Lomachenko was pen for pen number one or number two. Him and Terence Crawford are up there for me. Um, he's someone who I've admired my whole career. And for me to step into the ring and face him for a world title one day would be a dream come true. Mickey, talk about a dream come true. Every fighter has a dream. Every fighter has a dream fight that they want. Yeah. Who's your dream fight right now? And right why? now. Right, right now. now. The dream fight is Josh Warrington. Is that the dream? That's the dream fight. Josh Warrington in New York. You know, I could do it, but I could say Belfast, but it's close to home. Why not do it in New York? No, New York, New York. And the Irish built New York. So let's, let's do it in New York. And that's my home from home. And I know Josh Warrington wants to make his name in America and wants to crack America. Come and take me. Come and, come and dance. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. How would you see that fight going? Um, yeah, I think, I think his day is still a mate. I think it's still a mate. You know, he comes forward, he pressures. Um, and I'm just a boxer, so I can't fight on the inside either if, if people want to believe it. And, uh, you know, I'll be happy to dance. Inside or outside, really. I'll, I would easily box him, I think. But... You know, even on the inside. I think Josh Warrington, in my opinion, is a middle-range fighter. Um, he needs to be in mid-range to let his hands go. Um, so I think, I just think I would be too much um, in terms of my, my boxing ability. Um, I, can't, I, w- I would never underestimate him because people have underestimated him in the past and they see how everything has failed. And if you look at the, what do you call him? Uh, the Frampton fight and the Selby fight. No, you, know, you can tell that you know, this is something that these fighters have made a mistake of is, is uh, underestimating them. So, you know, I'll, I'll never do that. Wow, you just mentioned a huge, a huge, huge fight. That'll, that, that'll start off quite nasty. However, if it was said that you had to go to England for that fight, would you still be uh, considering it? Not one hundred percent. One hundred percent. He's a, he, he is the, he would be the champion, and I would have no problem traveling to England to face him. Nick, I want to talk about the hairstyle. What's going on? Is this a new look of yours, or is it just because you couldn't get a bob because of lockdown, or is this something the fans need to start getting used to? I think it's a it's a mixture of everything. It's a mixture of everything. I can't get a barber, so I got I let it grow. It's going in my eyes, so I tied up tied it up like this. And now I see Ronaldo was doing it, so I says, "Well, why can't McConnell do it? You know, <laughs> let's do it then." <laughs> um, then um, you mentioned you you would like to also move up to other weight divisions. Um, 
at one thirty, who yeah. who would you who do you look at at one thirty and think oh, that would be a nice fight at one thirty? Uh, to be honest, I haven't said even thought and thought about it, um, and I won't think about it until I win a world title at one twenty six because. If I don't win a world title at 126, I don't see a point in me moving up to 130. And, you know, if I look there now and say the great fighters who are there, you know, who's the, who is the champions? There's, you know, Bel- Belchant, Ber- Berlchant, or however you say his name, um, Jamal Herring. Uh, who, yeah, who's the other guys? Um, yes. Who, yes. Who yes. Yes, is IBF champion. Who did Juju Diaz and, and, and WBC, WBO? Who's WBA? I'm unsure. Um, just gone blank, actually. That's uh, just crazy. That's <laughs> yeah, gone blank. So I don't even. I kind of. I, I haven't even thought. But you know, they're all very good fights. They're all. They're all very good fighters. Um, people who I would be interested in in, in boxing, and I you know people who I would have a lot of respect for in the game. So, so he has a non-boxing related question. What do you, when you're not, when you're not in training camp and you, you're not in the ring, I mean, what are you doing chilling at home? What's, what's, what do you, what do you get up to? Do you want me to be a hundred percent honest with you what I'm doing in lockdown? All I'm doing is playing so, Besides having cook-offs or, or like food <laughs> competitions with Tris Dixon. The, the cook-offs, the bake-off stuff that, or, and, and cook-off stuff, that all happened at the start. That's finished. That's finished. All I'm doing now. <laughs> Is playing poker on Call of Duty, <laughs> and I'm, I'm spending my nights <laughs> sitting playing the game and playing Call of Duty. Um, but when I'm not in training camp, when I'm at home, I just I'm, I'm a family man, man, so I just stay with a family. And uh, and you know, I, I love being around my kids. I, I've I've been boxing 20, 21 years now, oh, 21 years of my life. I'm 28, boxing since I'm seven years of age. It's a lifetime. I'm away 70 percent of the time. Seventy percent of the year, I'm in training camp in England. I'm away from my family, away from my kids. So this lockdown has actually been really beneficial for me mentally, physically, everything. Um, I've really had fun. I've I've been around my family the whole time, and it's been fantastic. So you know, it's um, it's something that I, I'm really grateful for is the lockdown. And, and and when I'm at home, when I'm out of training camp, when the lockdown is not going on, I'd be doing the same thing I'm doing right now. So um, I, I'm I'm in a good place. And that, that's my next question to you is that I want to talk about your family. So you boxed for 21 years. Who was your inspiration? Because your brother was a world-class fighter, fought for the world title, Jamie. Was there anyone else besides your brother? You said your dad's involved in boxing with you in your career. Was there anyone else giving you inspiration at, at a very young age? It would have only been my dad and my, my brother. Um, my dad was my coach, and he's actually the coach of the Irish Olympic boxing team um, at the minute. So he, he was my coach since I was a kid, um, someone who I've always looked up to, a man who I always want to be like. Um, but other than him, it was Jamie. If Jamie had have stopped boxing when I was, say, 14 or 15, I would have stopped boxing because all my life I just wanted to be like my big brother. Like, like everybody, anybody has a big brother, just kind of want, looks up to their big brother. And I was always inspired by him. He was, he was my superman and well, he was who I wanted to be like. So. Um, yeah, he was the only guy I really looked up to. And and, and you mentioned you mentioned your dad's still involved in your career. How how involved is he right now? Given that well, as, as a at the minute, because we're in lockdown, he's the only guy I'm training with. So he's doing an awful lot of the bad work. <laughs> um, but no, listen, my dad and my brother Jamie is Jamie's my manager. Jamie looks after me and does everything for me. Um, any any anything to do with a fake in Jamie's person handle and everything. Um and then my father, he's a person who I go to for an honest opinion. I'll send them videos in my sparring, what do you think? And if someone's telling me it's good, I'll send it to him and he'll probably tell me, No, that is shit. You need to do better than that. You're you're that's not as good as what you think. You're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong and he'll be honest and, and that's what you need. You need someone who's gonna be, be straight with you and you know, I'm I'm lucky enough to have my coach and uh, uh, my father and my brother who are always kind of going to be like that for me. So it's something I'm, uh, I'm grateful for in that sense. Now you, you've had a great amateur career, a great professional career with the boxing hub of Africa, I'd say South Africa. And there's young kids that obviously want to take up the sports. 
it, putting yourself in a motivational sort of position, almost speaking to a younger version of yourself, um, how would you talk to a young South African boxer sort of asking you for your advice? Like, be what, Olympic, aim to be Olympic champion. No, I, in my opinion, you know, the Olympic Games, I've done two Olympic Games and I think that's the pinnacle of boxing. The Olympic Games is, is just a special, special feeling being there. Uh, and you know, I, I faced Peter from I think I think I faced Peter from Ghana, my first Olympics. Um, and, and you know, the African, South African kind of fighters, they're dangerous. They they all can punch, and, and you know, you can feel. I fought Duke Mika um, in my first games. Um, he's actually a pro now. I think he's twenty twenty two or twenty one and zero. Um, but the Olympic Games, even for the Olympics, man, the Olympics are, are are a special place. You know, being there, being an Olympian. No one can ever take that away from you, and you know I think if you can if you can get there and set yourself up for the professional game, it's the best way to go about it. There's no point of going. Well, there is a point if you can turn if you can't make the Olympic Games, you go pro. Yes, but if you really want to make it in the pro game, I believe the Olympics is the right pathway. Mick, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you here on the Boxing Lockdown. A message for the South African fans tuning in and watching this. Listen, guys, keep supporting boxing. Boxing is fantastic. Um, support all. South African fighters out there, and you know, I know there's an awful lot of good ones. My good friend, the Dumo de Lumati. So, um, yeah, thank you, thank you guys for your support as well. I really appreciate it, and, and thank you for having me on the podcast. It's you know, it's, it's been fantastic. It's been great chatting to him, and it's been great hosting the Boxing Lockdown, powered by SA Boxing Talk. We will catch you again soon. Yeah.